Thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. How are you today? Great. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Very excited to have you on the podcast. I know we spoke recently and I'm glad we were able to schedule this soon and, and have you tell your story about yourself and the World Telehealth Initiative. I would love if we could just get things kick-started by you telling the audience a little bit about yourself and then we can go from there. Sure. And thank you for having me. My name is Sharon Allen and I am the executive director for World Telehealth Initiative. And how I got here was rather a circuitous route. Um, I previously was in corporate leadership in the for-profit world for 25 years and reached a place where I had experienced success, fulfillment, but was looking for that something with a little bit more um, social impact rewards. So I transitioned to the nonprofit world. And when I was looking at various nonprofits that I wanted to be involved with, I met um, Dr. Yulin Wong, who was interested in starting this nonprofit. He's the founder of InTouch Health which is a provider of um, high-end telehealth technology, primarily for hospitals and health systems. And they are the biggest provider in the US and telehealth, as everyone knows now, is certainly a proven solution for delivering healthcare. But really those that need access to healthcare the most are those that will never be able to afford this technology. So with that in mind, we co-founded the nonprofit World Telehealth Initiative in order to provide sustainable medical expertise to the world's most vulnerable communities. And we do it through the donation of um, the telehealth technology. And then we combine that with volunteer professional medical expertise that we um, are able to provide into the vulnerable communities around the world. So it's, it's just, it's really a little bit of magic. The telehealth equipment is provided, the, the uh, physician expertise is donated by these humanitarian doctors all around the world. And then we just match them with the needs of our various partners that are located in very low resource areas. So as executive director of World Telehealth Initiative, I just get to kind of sprinkle the magic and, and make it all happen. Very interesting. So if a, let's say a physician wants to volunteer with your organization, I guess, how does that process look like? Like they're interested. So they reach out to you? Like, what does that look like? So oftentimes, um, uh, doctors or healthcare providers find out about us. Sometimes I um, speak at telehealth conferences or healthcare conferences. And whenever there's doctors in the audience, immediately, you know, we get an influx of interest. As it turns out, 80% of doctors want to volunteer in this manner. Some of them are able to do medical missions, but of course that requires them clearing their calendar for weeks at a time, getting on a plane, um, it's expensive. And so not many of them are able to do that. But this is all we ask is that they start with one hour a month and they simply open their laptop or their desktop at their home or at their office and they beam into, you know, say Bangladesh or Ethiopia. So they start with one hour a week. It's a very digestible um, chunk of time. So doctors are really clamoring to join um, WTI, is what we call World Telehealth Initiative for short. Um, so now we actually have thousands and thousands of doctors that are asking to join. They come to us via the website, like I said, when they hear of WTI from um, speaking engagements. Now a lot of it is word of mouth. We've had large physician associations say, you know, we want to do this. 
So that was one of our questions when we launched the nonprofit was, you know, will we have a critical mass of volunteer expertise, you know, to operate in this way? And that has been incredibly um, um, fulfilling to see the response that that we've we've had in that way. So there are no shortage of doctors that, that want to serve in this way. Interesting. Perfect. So I like that you start with one hour per week. You're not overwhelming the providers. Almost everyone, no matter how busy they are, can volunteer that amount of time if they are interested, right? So that was a good start. Perfect. So we actually, it's one hour a month that we start. Oh, one hour a month. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, yeah. it's a very low bar. <laughs> yeah, that's that's even better. One, one hour per week was fine. That's, e wow. Okay. Um, is there a limit to, can they work as much as they want? Yes. And so often is what happens is they start with that one hour a month. And then, you know, we get a call like, well, can I just do this every week? And so then they transition to one hour a week. Some, you know, depending on their specialty, like, for example, emergency medicine doctors, sometimes they say, you know, I'll be on call on Saturdays or I can, um, you know, call me anytime on, you know, in the evening or so that's part of the challenge of what WTI does is is working this algorithm, you know, for making the matches of the expertise to the locations that are requesting that expertise. And um, and we work, you know, with what the physicians are able to give as as far as their their time and and that. So um, it, it's it's amazing, though, that we have enough to kind of cover all of the needs of our current partners. Very cool. Okay. And how many, like what, I guess, what specialties do you work with? We actually have a lot. Um, for example, some of our partners, for example, in Malawi, we, that was our first project where we started with an obstetric fistula care clinic. And so they, re they wanted surgical mentoring for their new physician that was on site. Um, she had recently, finished her fellowship and was was starting to um, do independent surgeries and she could cover about 50 percent of what she saw but because there's such a wide range of cases some of them were a little bit outside of her scope so we paired her with um, fistula surgeon experts out of Texas, and they were able to beam in and mentor her through any novel surgery. And so over the course of about 18 months, her proficiency increased to where now she is, is an expert and she can handle her caseload completely independently. So that was a case where they just wanted one sort of expert, which we linked them with. Now, other programs, for example, the Rohingya refugee camp in Bangladesh, they see a myriad of, of medical needs. And so we have clinical consultations in neurology, dermatology, infectious disease, internal medicine, cardiology, behavioral health, you name it, whatever they need, we can find those experts that want to provide their expertise so I would say there's, we probably have 25 different um, medical specialties that, that we provide. And it's, it's really dependent on what the site is requesting. And is it primarily only physicians or do you work with advanced practitioners, PAs? So right now we're actually working with all physicians, but there is no reason that it it cannot transition to really any healthcare professional. So we've had some initial conversations um, around physical therapy programs, or um, right now we have psychiatrists, but we can also, you know, mental health is huge right now in, um, you know, especially in light of COVID. Um, so we can work with therapists and they don't have to be physicians. That's kind of where we started and, and where things are now, but there's no reason that we can't expand to include other healthcare professionals, many of which are asking to, to join our programs. So if a physician joins your program and can provide care, 
is there a process in like, do they need to get licensed in a certain country that they're providing the care in? Like, what does that look like? So um, we always maintain the standards. Typically we work with the ministers of health within the country in, in which we're operating. And that is extremely helpful. Many, many of the countries don't really have a telehealth policy because they don't have much telehealth. But that's changing. The um, World Health Organization actually recently formed a digital health um, board of advisors and roster of experts. And I have been selected to join that. And it's incredible because this really does take a global effort. And as telehealth you know, becomes more integral into the delivery of healthcare, it, it really should have policy around it and, and making sure that the platforms are safe and, you know, all the um, needs are being met in, in the best way possible. So now um, it, it will be kind of under the domain of the World Health Organization to, to create policy on a global level. So yes, we always make sure that, that we're uh, following their guidelines. And furthermore, our physicians that have joined the ranks of WTI, they're almost considered like a curbside consult or a clinical consultation, but the goal is really to support the local provider. So our underlying objective is to give the local provider the knowledge and the expertise and the confidence to treat their own community. So if WTI were to leave or to go to the next location, this site should be much better off in caring for their own community. So that's our first objective. So we always come in to support them in their delivery of care. Perfect. Very interesting. How, how has, sorry, how have things changed since COVID? Like, what are you seeing in the space? Uh, things that things have definitely changed since COVID, and right. and there are actually silver linings. But so right now we currently have fifteen programs that are up and running. And so right when the pandemic hit, of course we reached out to our partners and said, how can we support you? Have your needs changed? Is there additional expertise you need? And some of them, like uh, for example, the fistula care clinic, they stopped elective surgeries um, as, as many places did to concentrate on, on the COVID response. So that device, for example, we moved to the public hospital and that was, um, um, recommitted to a pediatric HIV um, department because they're, they were considered high risk with COVID. So whatever um, the site requested, you know, we responded. In um, Bangladesh, they very quickly with, you know, in under three months, they built a 50 bed um, isolation unit in, you know, to prepare for COVID. It, it hadn't even, you know, actually reached their, their borders when they started this. But that was incredible because we were able to pair them with physicians that were on the front lines in the U.S. that were really in the trenches and really seeing what worked, what didn't work. And so they were consulting the Bangladesh providers in what the best ways to, to set that up was and what they needed as far as in, you know, acute respiratory distress training and all those things. So it, it depended, you know, our response was dependent on, on what they asked for. And, and I would say the silver lining of COVID is that many practitioners that had certainly heard of telehealth before, but hadn't dabbled in it now in the US and Europe and you know much of the high income countries most doctors are very familiar with telehealth and now they see the benefits and there is no fear factor in it and they realize that it can be an option for the delivery of healthcare so now we've had an influx of doctors say oh now i get it i'll sign up for this telehealth is great so that's kind of a silver lining in that now even more people realize that you could be anywhere in the world and, and deliver your expertise so seamlessly. So um, COVID has definitely changed um, 
the um, the outlook on telehealth in in for the better. So that's that's the silver lining of it anyway. What would you say the second half of 2020 looks like? What does that look like to you for your for your organization moving forward? Our organization is is really popping at the seams. So the second half, you know, we're we're having to build our infrastructure bigger so we can handle more um, healthcare providers and more sites. I mean, our applications that are qualified locations that can support a program like this. We just want to be able to increase our impact because we know this works. We know we could help them. So we just need the infrastructure in place in order to do more of what we do. Perfect. And my last question, where can people learn more about your organization? Our website is the best place to go. It's worldtelehealthinitiative.org. And you'll find information about us. You can contact us. We have um, a page where physicians can sign up through the website and we, we get back to them. Um, so that is kind of the, the one-stop shop to, to find out more. Perfect. And I'll throw those into the show notes so people will be easily able to get direct to those sources. Great. Perfect. Well, again, thank you so much for, for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. I look forward to continuing to follow the organization and stay in touch with you. And uh, it was it was a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you, Jared. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.